Hi, I'm Jason Hooper from FixYourGut.com, and today I want to talk about the biological reasons behind hedonic adaptation. So what's hedonic adaptation? Well, let's say you went out right now and you bought a brand new Ferrari FXXK for just north of $4 million. Well, your dopamine response would be sky high because you have a brand new supercar that's track ready and the K stands for that kinetic recovery system that's in there and you would just be over the moon for about a month and then your levels would just kind of reset and then that would just be your car and it wouldn't be special anymore. So why does this occur? Well, it's because um, as your body creates more dopamine, your neurons create more dopamine receptors. And your body doesn't really care about how much dopamine is in the system, but it looks at the ratio between the D1 receptors and the free dopamine that's not bound to a receptor. So the dopamine gets released and then it finds a receptor and it binds. And that's how your body will detect how much bound dopamine there is and how much free dopamine there is and that ratio is important. Well, the more dopamine you produce, the more receptor sites are produced and then that ratio gets out of whack and eventually everything balances back out. That's part of how we achieve homeostasis. And so, in many things in life are sort of like this. And in this video, in part three, we're gonna focus on behaviors and lifestyle things and how to manage that adaptation, that hedonic adaptation, and how to reinforce the behaviors and habits that we want while restricting the ones that are harmful to us. So if you haven't watched part one yet or part two yet, don't worry, you don't need to watch these in any order. Part one dealt with the foods that we eat and the taste receptors in, in your taste buds that influence the amount of dopamine that you have. Part two was other sorts of compounds, drugs and foods that can in influence your dopamine. And in, in this phase, we're going to look at the external factors, the things in our lives that um, can influence our dopamine levels that we may want to eliminate, restrict or modify to, to work out better for you. And part four is going to be about bedroom activities and because of its content it will be membership only because our advertisers here on the YouTubes will not appreciate that content. Right, so I'm going to try to talk about these things in order of importance and I think the very most important thing is probably your circadian rhythm. So remember that the word midnight meant the middle of the night. And so if you think about it, that should be halfway through your sleep cycle. So if you're getting eight hours of sleep, who's really going to bed at 8 p.m. and getting up at 4 a.m.? Not too many people. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but optimally speaking, you should be asleep when the sun is down and awake when the sun is up. And if you deviate from this, it does have an impact on dopamine. If you stay up past your bedtime, your dopamine receptors start to activate and you start to get alert and your adrenal system kicks on and says, there must be a reason why we're up so late. You know, uh, let's, let's be alert and be aware. And the more that you, you do this habit, the more those dopamine circuits are gonna reinforce that behavior and the harder it's gonna be to start getting to bed on time. So the first thing that you need to do is make sure that you have good sleep hygiene, that you go to bed at a reasonable time every night and wake up at a reasonable time every day and try to keep those times consistent even on the weekends. If you're gonna be staying up past where you probably should, try to mitigate some of that damage that's being done to your hormones and neurotransmitters. Try to reduce the amount of light that you're taking in not just blue light but total light makes a difference too there's new research coming out of stanford university that shows that the light frequency may not play as big a role as they once thought and the actual brightness of the visual light spectrum seems to matter much much more 
There are also other activities that can drive up dopamine that you probably want to avoid right before bedtime. And we'll talk about uh, several activities that drives up dopamine and just keep those in mind when you decide to do some of these activities. Um, usually high dopagenic activity should be done earlier in the day, definitely not after sundown. Uh, think of yourself as like a little gremlin character. Don't eat after sundown, uh, especially not dopagenic foods. Don't exercise. Don't do uh, things that have a lot of bright light, you know, and we'll talk about some other activities later that should probably be reserved for other parts of the day. So the next most important thing is probably our relationship with phone and email. And a lot of us have these little things with apples on them and whatever that seem to have a lot of control and influence on our lives. And you have to understand that every time you get a text message or any time you get an email and you're checking that thing, you get a little spike of dopamine every time and it's reinforcing that behavior. Why? Because it could be a positive text message or it could be a negative text message. And so again, the logical centers of the brain are not processing this. It's the amygdala. It's the reptile brain that's saying, hey, is this a monster or is this going to be a tasty snack? You know, what's, what's this notification mean? Um, and so when you're evaluating this, you'll rationalize your choice later but it's the amygdala that's being overstimulated by the ding of your phone or email or whatever. Now, I'm not telling you to give up your phone or your email. That's ridiculous. Right? You have to be pragmatic about this. Now, I take breaks from this stuff. I will just go out where I have no internet signal, no cell phone signal, none of that, and I'll just go out there and go fishing or something like that and just really detox from dopamine, you know, go on a hunting trip or whatever, and that seems to really help to do that periodically. But if that's not in the cards for you, check your phone and email less frequently, okay? Don't let the tail wag the dog, okay? You're in control of what happens. And Brandon Burchard has uh, a great quote out there that says that your email is a complex organizational system to set you on other people's agendas or something like that, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the point is you have to read and respond to other people that can completely change the outcome of your day. Whereas if you check your email only once a day and then get back to other people, then you do whatever you want during the day and you're just dealing with them during you know that half an hour, hour, however many emails you get, however long that, that period is, you know, that's when they get your time. But you, you also have to fight for your own time too. You know, we're competitive with our time and who we spend our time with. And some people just go way overboard uh, and, and let other people manipulate their days. So watch out for that. So the next topic I want to go over are our spending habits. And the example that I brought up at the beginning of this video was about buying a new car. Now obviously we're not buying new cars all the day, but how many times are we compulsively buying things? Okay, They have the compulsive aisle section at the checkout line in the store you know, where they've got packs of gum. It's like, oh, I'll just throw on a little extra, again, just a little bit of a dopamine boost and then we keep reinforcing these habits. Uh, some people have a very unhealthy relationship with Amazon Prime and they're getting new packages every day and they're getting all this stuff. Now, not only does this increase your dopamine levels and increase the amount, over time, increase the amount of receptor sites that become available that kind of make your dopamine out of balance, this can also reinforce habits that are really tough on your finances. So with your phone and your email, you're doing things that just takes up a lot of your time and with your spending habits well now you're doing things and changing your behaviors that are going to eat up a lot of your personal finances and, and the reason why i put circadian rhythm above both of those is because you're sometimes developing behavior patterns that you're having to sacrifice your health for and 
that's no good. Now, back in the caveman days, if Grok the caveman wanted to uh, leave his home in Kilimanjaro to talk to his buddy in the Cape of Hope, well, it would take weeks for that journey to talk to his friend. But now, social media is just instant. We can talk to anybody around the world instantly. And our biological adaptation has not caught up to the technological adaptation that is required for this stuff. So it's very important how we manage social media. Some people can get addicted to the likes and the thumbs up and the views and the page counts and all this stuff and they check it constantly. And again, this increases the amount of dopamine so your body creates those dopamine receptors and then when you do something that's meaningful and positive in your life, it's not going to feel as stimulating because you know, you've been checking your Instagram all day long. So just be mindful of that and maybe limit your amount of time on social media. One thing that you can do is hide your social media apps on your phone or your other devices to make sure that you're using them you know, responsibly and taking care of business first. And then if you have time at the end of the day, yeah, go check out that other stuff. But this isn't even limited to social media either. Like if you've got an uh, auction item listed on eBay that you're, you're putting up, you might want to check to see, you know, are people bidding on this or whatever, you know, maybe you're checking the stock market. How's the S and P 500 doing, you know, what's, you know, what's Elon Musk up to, you know, with, with Tesla, um, <clears throat> that could, that could also really influence your, your dopamine output, looking at your news feed all day long, uh, you know, that can mess you up as well. So be conscious of where you're spending your time electronically. And again, don't let the tail wag the dog. If you're going to do that stuff, it's best to do it where it's, you know, maybe during your lunch break or something like that. And then that's it, you know, and definitely don't do this stuff late at night. You know, I knew a guy who couldn't even carry a conversation with me because was, every time I was trying to talk to him, he was checking his fantasy sport league or whatever. And, um, you know, that's almost a form of gambling. And gambling is even more dopagenic because you've got the combination between, you know, the electronics and finance all wrapped up into one thing. Um, and it, it can be very exciting and people can develop compulsive gambling habits because again, they keep reinforcing those positive circuits in the brain and can become very difficult for them to stop. Some people get addicted to work and work can be dopagenic too because once you have a task and you complete it, then you get that dopamine spike going up. So maybe it's best to think of the big picture and thinking of, you know, instead of checking each item off your to-do list, think about what's going to happen in a week, what's going to happen more long term, because some people just get addicted to completing stuff and they can't stop and they just work from sun up to sun down or sometimes through the night just taking care of projects and getting that stuff and maybe they get a commission and they get more money and then they get some more rewards reinforcement from that in the brain and it's another thing that I see a lot are just people that become addicted to their work because of the way the brain works and the way those dopamine circuits reinforce behaviors. At the end of the day, how should you relax? A lot of people are doing things that make them think they're winding down, you know, like having a drink at the end of the day, when in fact it's actually putting more stress on them. And there's sort of the illusion whenever we're numbing down the prefrontal cortex and activating other areas of the brain, we're not as conscious of the effects that that's having on us, especially later in the day and at night when we should be winding down and preparing for sleep. So if you play video games, especially late at night, it's extremely dopagenic. You've got the flashing lights, you've got the outcomes of success and failure and all this other kind of stuff. And some of these online games can just go on for hours and hours. And one of the issues with the video game stuff is that the, the barrier to entry is pretty low and it's something that you can do all day long and keep getting that dopamine rush and then 
everything else in life just kind of seems bland in comparison. So be very careful with your video game use and I would definitely discourage you from doing it at the end of the day. If you're going to do that, do it sort of at the beginning of your day, not just when you wake up because when you wake up, you know, you should be doing your morning ritual, trying to go outside and get sunlight, establishing your circadian rhythm. But after that, you know, that's the best time for it in the day and definitely limit your amount of time that you're spending with video games. Not quite severe as video games are movies, particularly action films, thrillers, and all these movies are great. Uh, but again, it kind of numbs down your prefrontal cortex uh, because you're not having to develop the this, this story or participate in it in any way. You're just kind of receiving the content. And so, again, it's kind of like alcohol where it numbs down your prefrontal cortex and then it's exciting other parts of your brain. Um, and again, movies are great, but you could binge on Netflix all day. In, some, in fact, some people do. And you can waste a lot of time, and then when you're done, it's like, uh, real life is not as exciting. Let's get back to Breaking Bad or whatever. Um, and, and the content seems to be important, too. If it's something that's um, it, more exciting, something where there's more action, fast-paced, maybe even sports, uh, that has a bigger impact on dopamine than a documentary or something a little bit more key. So maybe later in the day, say you know, use those documentaries to kind of calm down and relax instead of that thriller movie or Saw 8, The Massacre of Saw Blades or something, I don't know, whatever. Now, exercise is dopogenic. And it's not quite the same as video games or movies because for most people, you can't exercise all day long. It, there's a built-in limit to it and a built-in entry cost that sort of limits the activity. However, some people can get addicted to exercise. Um, it can overactivate those circuits, but if you're going to be addicted to something, exercise is far better than being addicted to gambling, online shopping, or you know, addicted to your social media. It seems to be more productive, but you must balance your exercise too. So again, it's better to exercise during the daytime, not at night, because of those dopamine circuits. In fact, especially for men, your testosterone is way higher in the morning than it is in the afternoon. So you'll have a much more productive workout. So manage your time with that. Um, it's maybe even after work is a good time to exercise because when you're working, especially if you do something that's cognitively demanding, it's been shown that exercise helps to reinforce what you just did. So if you're learning a new skill or you're studying, you have to remember something, you exercise immediately after that, what happens is your brain uses that dopamine to reinforce whatever you just did cognitively and those memory circuits start to reinforce and become stronger. So that's a good thing to do, but you can go overboard with the exercise. I mean, you've got people that they can get rhabdo because they're working out so much and then they're in the hospital or they can you know, get severe injuries because they just go too far with it. It's rare, but it can happen. Now, should you take breaks from exercise? I do. I mean, when I go on vacation, I'm not going out to the gym every day and doing all that kind of stuff. You know, I just take a break, let my body relax, let my body heal. And then when I go back to the gym later, my hedonic set point has lowered back down. But you have to have some dopamine, right? We have to have some kind of stimulus to function. And if you use exercise wisely, you can replace some of those unhealthy habits, you know, like gambling or social media or whatever, replace it with exercise, something that actually has some benefit to it instead of all of the detriment. And you can use that strategically to get a little bit of dopamine to make yourself feel excited and happy without having these catastrophic consequences later down the road. So what are some other healthy ways to get a little bit of dopamine so that you're not just bored all day long, but it's leading to more positive behavior patterns? Well, I think reading is a great thing to do, uh, especially if you're reading articles on fixyourgut.com. 
but seriously, uh, you know, just when you're reading, it's not as stimulating as watching television or watching a movie or a YouTube video or something like that. If reading's not your thing, maybe you're too stimulated on dopamine and just reading is so boring that you just can't, you just can't do it. Uh, maybe start with an audio book or a podcast or something like that in your level of interest, particularly late at night, you can do that to unwind. Podcasts are good because you can listen to them and you don't have to deal with the screen a lot of the times, so you can just listen to the stuff and leave the screen alone. You know, maybe if that's too stimulating, you know, if the topics that you're interested in are just too exciting for you, you can dial that back down also by just listening to some relaxing music or something that helps get you to sleep. In 2016, Boston College came out with a breakthrough research article where they took some candidates and they ran them through a 30-day mindfulness program where they just became aware of their thoughts and they, you know, they did just five minutes a day for 30 days. They did brain scans before and after and the impact that it had on the subject's brains was pronounced. The stress areas of the brain started to atrophy and the prefrontal cortex started to grow a little bit and the neurotransmitters started to reset and they started to lower their hedonic set point. It's incredible. It was so incredible that they repeated the experiment and got near the same results. And since then, this experiment has been done all over the world and the same results are coming out, you know, that just even after 30 days of mindfulness, it can make a huge difference. So perhaps you can counteract some of the unhealthy habits that you have that you're still working on or that you still have to do with a mindfulness practice. When you wake up in the morning, maybe you could just pay attention to your breath for five minutes. Just breathe in and breathe out and see how it feels. See how your nose feels when you're breathing in. Feel how your chest rises and falls. See if there's something going on with your back, you know, just listen to your body and hear what it has to say. And you'll learn a lot and you'll also learn that other thoughts will start to creep in and say, hey, social media or hey, hey, check your fantasy football league or whatever. And you'll just be able to treat these thoughts sort of like clouds passing through the sky. They'll float through your mind and you'll say, oh, cool, look at that. And then you'll just let it go and then return to breathing. Okay. Don't get discouraged if you've got these interruptions and you've got these thoughts that keep coming in. You're not completely focused on your breathing and you're listening 100% of the time. Don't be judgmental about yourself for having those thoughts because everybody gets them. Even the Zen masters get them. The important thing is just to acknowledge the thought, let it pass, and move on with your mindfulness. You know, if, if mindfulness isn't your thing, maybe you could do a gratitude list. You know, you could just take out a notepad and write down some things that you're grateful for every morning. And again, this will help to reinforce the good things in your life and the positive relationships in your life and, and the great things that are happening to you and to other people instead of some of these unhealthy habits. And the gratitude list, it can be just as effective as mindfulness and you can you actually use them in combination, not the same time, you know, you can do your mindfulness first and then get out your notepad and, and do a gratitude list. But I challenge you to do a gratitude list. Just write down what you're grateful for. It doesn't have to take a lot of time, but just do that every morning when you first wake up. Instead of checking your email or your social media, get out a notepad and just write what you're grateful for and see if that doesn't have a pronounced impact on your life. And you should see these results near immediately. You should feel different after doing this. Leave your phone alone for the first hour that you wake up and try to do some other activities that are actually good for you instead of catering to other people or other businesses or that kind of thing. Hey, maybe instead of sending that text or sending that email, you can pick up the phone and call somebody or better yet, meet them in person for coffee. 
reinforce these positive relationships in your life with a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact, phone call, something that's more interactional and where a screen doesn't divide you. Having good personal relationships is great because you do get a dopamine kick, you also get some oxytocin and you get a bunch of positive neurochemicals and you got people in your life that support you, love you and help you. It's much better than dealing with people on social media where you're basically seeing someone's highlight reel, you're seeing you know, content that they want you to see instead of actually having a conversation, getting to know people, supporting someone, being supported by someone, being there for somebody, having somebody there for you, much, much healthier than social media. So instead of Facebook, think phone call. Instead of text message, think meet for coffee. You know, this is going to be much better for you in the long run in developing healthy habits and making sure that you have a reasonable hedonic set point to where you don't have these spikes of dopamine occurring all the time. Well, that's about going to wrap it up for this video. If you want part four, go to the membership section on fixyourgut.com and sign up for it. It's very reasonably priced and you can check that out and other great content that John and I put out there that's just for members. A lot of this content is not YouTube appropriate. Not that it's all adult content in nature, but some of the things that we talk about are a little controversial and some of them don't quite fit the mainstream narrative that tends to be demonetized and deranked on the YouTubes and the Googles and all that stuff. So consider signing up for a membership. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button. Um, if you like the format that I've been doing with these videos, drop a comment in the comment section below, or if you have a question, you know, we can do that. Now, speaking of which, I don't go back and check my YouTube videos all the time because, you know, what we talked about today with, uh, you know, oh, I wonder how many likes this video's got or how many views this video's got. You know, I don't, I don't want to do that because it hijacks my brain. So what I do is I have someone that works for us that goes to the comment sections and if there's a question that needs attention or a comment that needs to be addressed, what they'll do is they'll just forward it to me and I'll create a response and then we'll manage it that way instead of me having to just keep checking the site. Oh, did somebody comment? Oh, did somebody hit like? Oh no, somebody hit dislike. That's terrible. You know, so that's, uh, that's just not something I check and I think it's much healthier. Um, and you know, having also somebody curate the comments to send me the things that are actually, you know, actionable and have bearing on what we're doing rather than just, um, you know, criticism for no reason or mean insensitive comments or whatever that probably get curated and deleted anyway. But anyhow, um, hit that subscribe button if you want to see more videos and you also have to hit the notification bell because even if you're subscribed, you won't get notifications when we release new content unless you hit the bell. So be sure to do both of those if you're not. It really helps our site and it gets this information out to more people and I think this information is, is mission critical to have having people live happy, healthy lives. So until next time, we'll see you later and have a great day.